Good morning. This is uh, D John Dieters, Doctor of Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine, and I'm here to talk about what I consider maybe the most important topic that we have to deal with today. It's uh, June 16th when this is being recorded, and we've just had some rollbacks and different masking issues and things uh, yesterday. And I'm here with Madeline from the Alameda Chamber of Commerce, and the first thing I would do is just commend her for the amazing job she's done and is doing at continuing to support the struggling businesses in Alameda. It's pretty amazing. I'm sure that many of the chambers are not very act, uh, active right now, but Madeline's always got stuff going on. So today I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you. Uh, again, I'm a doctor of acupuncture. I do primarily internal medicine and gynecology. Uh, my wife's a doctor of acupuncture, does sports medicine. She's the acupuncturist for the 49ers. And we have a, another sports medicine acupuncturist. And then Catherine Black works with me doing what we, what's called functional medicine and traditional Chinese medicine. I want to talk today about a solution to stress-related health problems. And specifically, acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine as scientifically proven, highly effective treatments for anxiety. And... Um, historically, the number one condition that was treated by acupuncture in the United States was back pain. Uh, but for the past several years, and this is pre-COVID, uh, even before the pandemic, the number one thing we treated was anxiety. Uh, we are a very anxious culture and we've gotten much more anxious, so it's a huge problem. Um, the highest number of treated patients by profession that I see are therapists. So psychologists, social workers, etc. I see every day many, many therapists. And many of those there because they're at the top of the food chain. They're seeing 40 patients a week who are suffering from massive anxiety and depression. And you can't do that for 40 hours without being affected. So I'm seeing them. I am also uh, have a lot of patients referred to me by these therapists. Um, just, you know, it's, in the U.S., there's not a lot of understanding about acupuncture, not like there is in Southeast Asia. Uh, if one does a quick check on PubMed, you'll find over 34,000 studies on acupuncture, on the efficacy of acupuncture, but also on why it works, how it works, how it affects the neurology. And great many of those are on anxiety. And here's just one I threw in out of 34,000, and it's about how electroacupuncture attenuates the stress response and how it does that specifically. And I have whole pages of these studies. So let's start with the definition of stress. Stress is a heightened response to routine and out of the ordinary conditions of events. It's actually a physics term uh, where it's talking about the load or the stress on a member a load-carrying member of a building, but it's been applied to our mental emotional states. And unfortunately, that heightened response results in many, many health problems largely related to the hormones that are released as in the stress response. So according to a recent Stanford studies, um, there were two of them, between 85 and 90 percent of all visits to doctors are for stress-related illnesses. So I, I want you to hear that. Patients come to me with headaches, they come to me with fatigue, they come to me with insomnia, and never really thinking that the problem is really stress. Now some people do come for stress, they can't live their lives basically, but most of my stress patients do not say I'm here for stress. They will give a whole litany of signs and symptoms and that's completely supported by these Stanford studies. Uh, people who experience heightened levels of anxiety, four to five times more likely to have a fatal heart attack or stroke. Again, it's really hard to get our heads around that number. You know, I was a workaholic most of my life and a stress monkey, and I just, you know, thought I was immortal, like many people do. I want you to have more sense than I did when I was younger, and I want you to start monitoring your stress levels now. You know, it's like, oh, another five years and I can retire. Yeah, well, another five years you may have a stroke. So you want to learn how to moderate and mediate your stress uh, 
and not just put it on the back burner. And again, 50% of all illnesses are directly, directly caused by stress. Um, and these are pre-COVID statistics. Uh, we saw a huge uh, increase in on-the-job injuries, uh, up to 15% more because of stress. 70% of people surveyed said they felt stressed in a typical day at work. I don't know where that, who did that study. It was a well-done study. To me, it's about 90% of my patients. 43% uh, surveyed said they suffered noticeable physical symptoms of burnout. They couldn't sleep. They didn't want to eat. It affected their love life. They didn't have a good relationship with their kids. And these are pre-COVID. Now we know with COVID, the opioid overdose deaths in the Bay Area are up 30%. Diagnosed anxiety and depression in children is up over 30%. And I'm bringing this up because you obviously want to take care of yourself and monitor yourself, but it's very easy to not take these kids' uh, anxiety seriously enough. Uh, several of the therapists that I work with work only with children uh, one woman brought in several people to help her, and she cannot keep up with the demand uh, for ang treating anxiety in kids. Uh, suicide deaths are up in all age groups, so please don't ignore this. Um, to avoid stress now, you know, to be realistic, you basically have to avoid life. You know, go live on a mountain somewhere and uh, uh, pick roots and berries. But, right? <laughs> I mean, that's just where we live. Uh, Hans Selye, who wrote the first definitive book on stress, he documented three stages, and I think this is a great way to look at this problem, three stages of stress. The first one is the alarm stage. Something happens, right? Your body, you know, the fire truck goes by. You, for me, you see a police car behind me, because when I was younger, I never paid to have my tags updated, and I was always behind. And every time a, a police officer pulled in beside, behind me, it was like, Oh my God, oh my God, he's gonna pull me over. Now, uh, that hasn't been the case in 40 years, right? My tags are always paid. I still have that same response when the cop pulls in behind me. Uh, I'm still worried again about getting pulled over. So, that alarm stage is normal, right? You know, we often liken to that to the see a tiger and run. The problem is the resistance stage. And so the body either adapts to the stress or resists it and returns to normal. So in the earlier example, let's say I slow down, the police car passes and I relax. Okay, great, pretty much done with. But let's suppose the police car does pull you over, I get ordered to appear in court in a couple weeks, and so for two weeks, most people are gonna worry like crazy. Oh my God, oh my God, can I fight this? What do I do? Should I show up in court, etc.? And now this is for a minor thing, for something more significant, like my patients that get called back uh, after a questionable mammogram, uh, which happens most of the time these days because the instruments are so sensitive, but then until they get their next mammogram, they are in this alarm stage and their stress hormones go up. Now, you can do that for a little while, but our bodies were not designed to stay under prolonged stress and what happens is if we end it too, too long, we go into the exhaustion stage. So here, we don't return to normal. So the event is over, you come home from work, you still can't relax, you still can't go to sleep, your mind is still uh, racing, and what happens is you get massively lowered body resistance, uh, lowered immunity, and body malfunctions. For example, Again, I mentioned my wife is the acupuncturist for the 49ers. Well, most professional football players get sick on Monday or Tuesday. That's because on Sunday they go out and they're gladiators and they're putting their lives on the line, basically fighting these 350-pound behemoths, and they have to use every ounce of energy they have. Well, on Monday they crash. And I have graphs that I could show you. It's quite dramatic because the immune system response can easily be graphed by monitoring a few chemicals. Well, in those players, on Monday, they bottom out. And then anything that's going around, they catch, they get sick on Monday or Tuesday. They're fine on Sundays, by the way, because that adrenaline's pumping, everything's going. Now, in the exhaustion stage, your nervous system overreacts, 
and stimulates the adrenal glands to activate and secrete their hormones. And there are several adrenal hormones. I like this picture because you've got this really well-conditioned young woman athlete, and this is a very common patient for me that would be uh, having adrenal stress and adrenal fatigue. Uh, they often, they over-exercise, they're overthinking, they're type A, and they end up really in trouble with chronic fatigue. So one hormone that we've all heard of is adrenaline, right? That gives you that boost of energy. It gets your heart pumping uh, in order to increase circulation. Now that's great if you're trying to get out of the way of a car or you have a close call with a car wreck, but obviously over time, this can cause heart disease and chronic high blood pressure. Second hormone that we don't hear as much about and is a major part of what I treat in my, pro uh, my practice is noradrenaline. Now this stops digestion by moving the blood from the abdomen to the arms and legs. Okay, you're gonna run away from a tiger, you gotta have all the blood you can get into your legs. If you're gonna be fighting something, you need a lot of blood in your brain and your hands and your legs, and so digestion takes a back seat. But what also takes a back seat are blood supply to the uterus and the ovaries in women. In fact, this is one of the major, major problems that I find with so-called unexplained infertility. I do a couple tests and we'll find that these women are suffering from massive anxiety and it's pulling the blood out of their internal organs. So we focus on that and voila, they get pregnant. Uh, those adrenal glands also release cortisol. Now, cortisol has become very, very well known. 20 years ago when I talked about cortisol, it was magical, strange thing. Now everybody knows about it, but most people don't know what it actually does. So cortisol is what wakes you up in the morning. It gives you what's called the dawn effect. It activates your blood sugar and activates your body to release other hormones to bring sugar into your cells so that you wake up. That's what wakes you up in the morning. Now, that's great, but if you keep getting that cortisol rush, it lowers your resistance to disease because your body basically has two modes. I'm either fighting something or I'm repairing. I'm fighting or repairing, and it doesn't do a good job of doing them both at once. So if you're burning cortisol, you're probably not healing during that time. So it'll cause fatigue, it causes weight gain. In fact, it purposely causes weight gain. This is not a side effect. This is a tremendously powerful um, human trait, is that when we're under stress, the body wants to slow down our metabolism so that we can get through the famine or the danger or whatever's occurring. And it does that through a couple mechanisms, uh, actually more, but a couple major ones. One is cortisol binds to a hormone called leptin, L-E-P-T-I-N, not to be confused with lectin, L-E-C-T-I-N, which is big in the news these days. But leptin is the hormone that does a couple of important things. One, it tells you that you've had enough to eat that you should be sated. And this is part of the French paradox. Uh, they eat very slow, relaxed meals with friends. They may sit for dinner for a couple hours. They have really, really rich food. They don't get diabetes and they don't get fat. That's because of that relaxation. So their leptin levels rise to the point that they don't eat too much. The second thing that leptin does is leptin uh, tells your body that it is safe to burn fat. So if you have high cortisol, it blocks leptin, so you don't get the message that it's safe to burn fat. That's why I have so many patients that come to me, uh, want to lose weight, and I will tell them, we need to work on your stress. Because as long as you're under that stress, your body will not want you to lose fat, because fat are your res is your reserve uh, against uh, future famine. So, you're going to get problems with sleep and a lowered immune system. Um, and also, because it's burning sugar, it gives you energy all day long, but when it's out of balance, you just get fatigue. And, as I, and the, the other way here that it lowers your um, ability to burn fat 
is it binds to one of the thyroid hormones and it diminishes that hormone's ability to uh, become the active thyroid hormone, T3. So once again, your body doesn't have enough thyroid hormone, even if it looks great on a test, uh, because you'd have to run a specific test to determine this, which I think should always be run, but it's not. Um, but at any rate, the high cortisol will block the ability of your thyroid gland and your thyroid hormones to do their job. Then, another hormone released by the adrenal glands is dehydroepiandosterone, or DHEA. And this hormone controls a lot of things, but one of them is estrogen reserves, and also the balance between progesterone and testosterone. And so what you'll see here is very imbalanced hormone levels. Once again, when a patient comes in with severe premenstrual dysphoria or menstrual cramping, this is the first place we're going to look, is what is the hormone balance? What's out of balance here? And is stress at the root of that? And often it is. It takes us usually two months to fix that. Uh, but part of that is getting the patient to be a little bit more relaxed. Okay. Even with the conclusive Stanford studies, it's still really rare for most medical doctors to test for adrenal imbalances or deficiencies. Uh, often they're given drugs for anxiety or depression without any lab testing. So that masks, but it doesn't cure um, the problem. And so here's just a little diagram up here. We have the hypothalamus, which is in the center of your brain, which is sending a message to your pituitary gland, which is sending a message to your adrenal glands. And then you see these red lines. Those, that's called a negative feedback loop. Well, once someone has been stressed for a very long period of time, those loops become inappropriate and imbalanced, and the brain stops getting the correct messages. So when it's time for the body to slow down and relax, it's not, the brain is not getting the right message, and it keeps pumping uh, hormones to the adrenal cortex to keep you stressed. So this is one of the major things, is we really need to reverse those feedback loops. Now, there are tons of lab tests can, that can indicate the severity of the problem. There are some that are very specific. Um, an adrenal stress index, for example, which is a saliva test. But there are blood tests that are as low as $14, that can give you a very, very good clue about um, whether you've got adrenal imbalance. So it's not expensive. But beyond that, there are tests that can be done in the office. In fact, with our new patients, uh, everyone gets at least one of these tests, and over time, we'll retest to see how people are doing. Um, one of those is called an adrenal function test. It's actually, the name was a Ragland's test. It was uh, created by a Dr. Ragland in the 1920s. And I just found his paper a, a couple months ago, and it's fascinating because they didn't have computers, right? So it's typewritten with all the typos marked out and then new spelling. So it's really fun to see his original paper. And he showed that the ability to maintain blood pressure when you change positions is a function of the adrenal glands. And there are two major mechanisms by which that works. One is called the aldosterone sy system, which you don't need to know, but aldosterone controls your sodium to potassium balance. So if your sodium is too low, for example, then you don't hold fluid, enough fluid in the blood, because the sodium and fluid balance needs to maintain um, a fairly narrow range. But if you don't have enough sodium, then you don't pull blood into your bloodstream. You have too little blood volume, and when you stand up, rather than increasing your blood pressure by 10 points, which should happen when you go from lying down to standing up, we'll see it drop uh, significantly. Uh, if it's 10 points, uh, that's something we need to look at but I'll see a lot of patients at 20, and my chronic fatigue patients will drop 30 to 40 points. So literally, the reason they feel lightheaded when they stand up is the blood is literally falling out of their brain. 
So, of course, they feel lightheaded. And so this we do in the office. It's a very simple test. I think it should be done at every initial intake through all forms of medicine. Uh, it's typically only done in your doctor's office if you come in complaining of orthostatic hypotension or when you stand up, you feel like you're going to pass out and you get dizzy, and then they may test it. Uh, legally, the definition of orthostatic hypotension is a drop of 20 points, uh, but you'll see symptoms uh, much sooner than that. A second test that can be done is a paradoxical pupillary response. Again, these are pretty inexpensive tests. Now, we all know that when you shine a light into your eye, that the pupil constricts, right? Well, what most people don't realize is that that constriction should hold for 30 continuous seconds. It should maintain that tightness. If it doesn't stay closed, that indicates weak adrenal glands or post-concussion syndrome in some cases. And post-concussion, I, I will always do this test. And so, um, typically with my adrenal patients, they're holding that pupil closed for four to seven seconds. That's how dramatic that is. So if that's happening, you can imagine how dysfunctional and disoriented the entire neurological system is at that point. Okay, so these are just some of the symptoms that I, you know, I could have listed a hundred, but fatigue, headaches, irritability is a biggie, sleep, allergies, uh, people don't think of that being related to anxiety, but it definitely is because the anxiety will cause your um, immune system to plummet. And digestive trouble is a major issue. Uh, as I mentioned, the noradrenaline pulls the blood away from your stomach. So then the process of digestion has to start, start when you stop being stressed, actually a while after you stop being stressed. So that's why it's very important to try to eat a nice, relaxed meal with your family. Um, don't talk about the day's problems. You know, keep it light and relaxed. Okay. Um, we're going to send to Madeline, and we'll probably have on our site. This is a stress survey. I just want you to go through it and mark it. You don't have to send it to us. Uh, you can send it to us, and we'll give you a response. But I want you to check things. Now, one of the things that's fascinating about Americans... So on here, one of the things is headaches. And people go, yeah, I don't really have headaches. Well, do you have headaches? Well, yeah, once in a while. How often? Once a week? Mm -hmm. Once a week. You know, children don't have headaches. Babies that are healthy don't have headaches. You shouldn't have a headache. Every time you have a headache, that's a sign that something's out of balance. So if you have headaches once every six months, mark headaches and do that with all of these problems even if they don't happen a lot. So I'd love to have you fill out the stress survey. Uh, if you want to send it in, we'll take a look at it. Um, if not, it's just for you to keep. Um, now, and this is really, this is one of my favorite uh, slides that I have, right? I mean, if you're driving your car and the check engine light comes on, we all know how to fix that. You put a piece of tape over it, right? Huh. But that's what we do with headaches. You're getting a headache every two days. Well, take an Aleve, take an Advil. That's the same as, literally, it's the same as putting a piece of electrical tape over your check engine light. What that headache means is, wow, I better get to the bottom of this and see what's causing that before it gets worse. Okay, so four major ways to reduce stress and a lot of small things to do um, I'm just going to mention a few of them here. One, I find this to be an amazing graph. Uh, it's a little small here, but it's total refined sugar consumption per person per year. Well, if you look at 500 AD, it's as close as you can get to zero. Basically, you had to uh, go all everywhere you could to try to find some fruit, which is typically in season for a couple weeks a year, or you were a beekeeper and got honey. And if you notice, up until about 16, 1700 AD, the sugar intake was about the same. In 1994, the average intake was 149.2 pounds. Now, since it was like that in 500 AD, it's probably been that level of sugar consumption as long as humans have been walking on the planet. 
So all of those years, we developed a system that was designed for less than a pound of sugar a year. So what do you think happens if we put 149.2 pounds of sugar? It's going to create, sure, weight gain, you're going to get fat, you're going to get fatigue, but it's also going to put massive amounts of pressure on your adrenal glands to deal with this stress because this is a stressor to your body. And that's why type 2 diabetes is a horrible epidemic in America. It's also, by the way, a hor uh, horrible epidemic in China. I did my diabetes training in China uh, because they are having massive problems. And the reasons are obvious. When you walk through a major city, uh, Shanghai, for example, downtown, every other store is a Starbucks or a KFC. We have taken over their, their food um, cravings, or they've taken over ours. Uh, Shanghai, the streets are ten, 10 lanes each way. When I was in China in the 1980s, typically if a 10 lane street would be an average of one lane of cars. Everything else was people bicycling, maybe a few motorcycles. Now it is 10 lanes packed of cars. So pollution, no exercise, poor diet, and they have become Americanized and now have massive diabetes rates. A uh, couple other things, women who regularly engaged in moderate activities, this isn't like going out and running a 5K, this was the realm of, of 20 minutes of walking a day, had a 41% lower death rate. That's pretty good return on your investment. Men, uh, this seven year study, uh, 20 minutes a day of on average of exercise, again, not intense exercise, just moving your body, uh, weightlifting actually was very superior, but again, short duration weightlifting, uh, only a couple times a week, 37% less likely to die of coronary disease. Huh. Now that I'm seeing this slide, I think I might end the presentation and go work out for a while. But it's really that dramatic, right? We tend to overlook it. Um, so, in order to heal, your body needs a constant flow of blood and nutrients. Constant. And... I've got films that I could show you of people that are under physical stress or under stress from being around a lot of electromagnetic flow, a lot of cell phones, computers, etc. And you can actually see their blood being hypercoagulable. And so it looks as, because there is a $25 million machine at an institute in Berlin where the, it seems like you're inside the blood vessel. It's that clear. And when people are in that stressed state, their bloodstream looks like rush hour on the LA freeway. The traffic isn't moving. You get to the little off ramps going into the smaller blood vessels. There'll be a six car pileup and literally no blood is getting into those small vessels. So if it's not getting into the small vessels, those, ve those cells are not being supplied with nutrients and the toxic elements are not being taken away. So it's the worst of all possible things. And then there are a few things you can do. You can do acupuncture, you can do uh, devices to neutralize the electromagnetic waves, and suddenly the blood starts shooting through there, just like um, the traffic jam has been relieved. Okay, so we don't want interruption of blood flow, right? If you get an interruption to the knee, you're gonna get arthritis. If you get an interruption to the other organs of the body, you're going to have other maladies. And so, any health problem, I know this is really hard to believe, any health problem can be helped with acupuncture. Uh, acupuncture, the brilliance of it was, or is, that the Chinese doctors mapped out the entire neurological system of the body and cataloged what each of those nerves and points did on the body 2,500 years ago. That didn't happen until in Europe until a few hundred years ago, and the Chinese understanding is still way beyond that we can do points in your hand that will send a stimulus up to your, um, your spinal cord, that sends a stimulus up into your brain, that causes the release of feel-good chemicals, GABA, oxytocin, serotonin, all the things that make us happy and healthy get released. So that's why I say 
no matter what you have, acupuncture can always help. It may not be the perfect treatment, right, for that problem, but it always helps because it increases blood flow and lowers pain. Um, right, and then we're back to headaches, asthma. Headaches are almost always a blood flow problem. Asthma is made much worse with blood flow problems. So, been doing this for 3,500 years in the East, millions and millions of people. Right now it serves two billion people. Unfortunately, there's no money in advertising it, so you're, you're not gonna see it on TV. Although there are a couple TV programs now that are kind of fun. Um, so, solutions to all sorts of things. We do nicotine and drug addiction, Stress and anxiety are the major things we're dealing with right now, uh, which then lead to digestive problems, low back pain, etc. But again, a lot of it comes back to stress, anxiety, and hormone imbalance, all of which are fixable. So, thank you. Thank you, Madeline, for all the great work that you do. Um, I don't know if anybody's online. If they are, I'd love to take some questions or some questions from you. Well, questions for me. First of all, thank you so much for this amazing presentation that you've done. So I started with several questions in mind, uh -huh. but covered them through many screens that you have. But I would like to know for people that are going to watch this presentation, if they are afraid of the word acupuncture mm -hmm. and they relate to it, I'm like, I don't want to get needles. Right. I'm going to go to a real doctor. What is your answer to that, Dr. Needers? Uh, my first answer is that that is normal. Right. We've all or at least almost all of us have gone through vaccination uh, with huge needles that are 100 times bigger than an acupuncture needle. And that's buried in our brain. It's like, oh, my God, they're going to stick a needle in me. They, you know, and um, I still, you know, I, my dentist is incredibly gentle. When I get in that chair, I almost start sweating. I'm so, I, it's just from my childhood. So, A, it's normal. B. We don't even have to use acupuncture. This is talking about acupuncture. We have many, many other forms of treatment. We have a little electrical stimulators we can do on the surface. Um, we have, and that's what I do with kids primarily, is I'll stimulate the points, and they think that's cool because it kind of tickles a little bit. Uh, our primary treatments actually, in my practice, because I do internal medicine and gynecology, my primary treatments are actually more supplement food, and herbal based. So just doing a consult when I see people's labs. Again, there are a lot of things that will trigger me to see that they have an endocrine problem. Well, that's a dietary lifestyle change. They don't have to do any acupuncture at all. And then often what I'll do is after a little negotiation, I'll say, let's do two needles. Little and I'll show them the needles. They're so tiny they can't see them, right? I have to hold it like right up to their face. And I'll say, let's do two needles. If you don't like it, we won't do any more. And as I'm talking to them, I'll put a needle in their calf. And then I'll go, are, are you ready now? And they go, oh gosh, doc, I'm really scared. I said, I'm already done, right? And they just start laughing. And I do this with kids too. It is so painless. Now my wife does a very different thing. Her primary modality is acupuncture. Uh, she needles into muscles and tendons, etc. But she's so accurate, she doesn't get much response either. And to, just to put it in perspective, with people that have fear, she treats these 350-pound defense or offensive linemen who, who get paid millions of dollars to go out and bang against a 1,000 pounds of beef on the hoof, basically. Uh, they get co constant shots, injections of everything you can think of, and they almost cry the first time they're told they have to have acupuncture because this training staff tells them, get acupuncture. But after the first time, it's like, really? That's it? And then they love, my wife, she sees so many patients in a day, it's crazy when she's down at the facility. So basically, A, it's normal, and B, we'll work around it, and C, you might want to try a needle or two and see that it's really nothing you need to be worried about. I think I only have one patient that we don't do acupuncture with. And probably 20% come in with that initial like, ooh, I don't know about this. I have one older patient suffering from dementia and that fear is so strong that we just use the electric stimulators on her and she loves it. Okay? Great answer, thank you. So another thing that I wanted to ask you about is 
what triggers someone to just basically make that phone call, even to get a telehealth uh, from you, when they they know in the back of their mind that they have stress and anxiety, but they're not acknowledging it. Right. So what would you advise these people? Um, one, Assume that your stress and anxiety is worse than you think it is. B, have someone in your life that you really trust to be straight with you to kind of monitor you. Like, Joe, you are really stressed and anxious. You need something. And so, because we're so used to the level of stress. I mean, the least stressed person in our culture is probably more stressed than the highest stressed person living in Bali. Right? They don't even have a word for stress in Bali. Right? It doesn't exist, basically. But so for us, we've become so used to it that we just don't get how bad it is. So I would say, trust someone else. Look to someone outside of you. Uh, often, you know, people don't listen to their husband and wives very much about that, but if, if that might work. But have a friend, a colleague, someone you work with, and just say, hey, what do you think? Do you think my stress or my depression or my moods, are those an issue? And then take action on it. And again, that's why I've done this, uh, the free gift. I just want at least that not to stand in people's way. You know, Dr. Needles, I think because we all have, everybody has stress. I mean, I know have a lot of pressure and stress myself, but I think we get used to living with it, that it becomes part of our life, and we don't recognize that we are going through it. Unless someone comes and tells you, you know what, you are really exhausted and yeah. burned out, you should go yeah. and see someone, right? Yeah, someone in my life, who will go un un unnamed, uh, was having um, horrible symptoms, lightheaded, uh, their chest, their heart was pounding, etc. And finally, I insisted that they go to the hospital. You look, you need to go in and get checked. And they did all the heart tests, they did all the stuff on them. And they couldn't find anything. And finally, this very kind, sweet um, doctor came in, a young woman, and said, you know, dear, I'd like you to take this pill. And this, my friend said, what's it for? She said, well, it's for anxiety. And the person said, I don't have anxiety. Well, just go ahead and take it. Fifteen minutes, all of her symptoms were gone, a hundred percent. But in her mind, in her self-identity, she was not a person that would have a panic attack. She was not a person that would have anxiety, but it was clearly anxiety and a panic attack. And so that is something we have to deal with. My personal thing, I was a workaholic. I worked 100 hours a week for 40 years, basically. And then when I finally said, you know, I'm going to slow down. So I would, it took me six months, literally, before I caught myself. So I'd be sitting in the chair, reading the paper, reading a book, and all of a sudden I would get this slight panic reaction, like, oh my God, I need to. And it took me six, and, and then I'd realize I didn't need to do anything. That was just my old habit. And it took me six months before I actually did not have that reaction when I was sitting in my chair. So again, I wouldn't have said that I was a high stress person or had high anxiety, because I'd learned to deal with it, I'd learned to live my life with it, but the truth was, I was a mess, right? And so, it just comes down to acknowledging. And anybody that has gone through the last year and a half, particularly in the Bay Area, has massive anxiety and stress, and the sooner you get rid of it, the better. I agree with you, and I guess um, I'm one of the people that lives in denial, oh, I'm not stressed, but I am. I can tell. And I think if we take care of ourselves and reach out and get the solution, we'll have better performance at work, better relationships with our significant others and families. Uh, so I'm advising everyone to take Dr. Je uh, Dr. Neither's offer, General's offer, to take him up on that telehealth because it's a phenomenal thing. I did have the opportunity and the pleasure to be um, taken care of by him a couple of times for headache and for a knee injury and um, I read by his experience and I really recommend him very much because like I said he did treat me so I know normally if you go to an experience and you have a positive experience you need to make sure that you be accolade that person and really become their advocate so I am advocating for Dr. John Needles completely 100%. Thank you so much for your time today. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.
comments Dr. Needle that I would like to share with everyone? No, just again, I couldn't appreciate more the work that you do with the Chamber and your support for everybody involved, and in particular, your kind words about what we do. So thank you so much.